Welcome to Convocation. My name is Aubrey Mintz. I'm head of animation in the illustration animation program in the School of Art. This year in the animation program, we were very fortunate to have a visit from Pixar Animation Studios, who you'll know from movies like Finding Nemo, Inside Out. And as part of their mission right now, they're touring the globe to look for new, fresh voices for future artists at Pixar Studios and to help with the industry. This is where they met our senior student, Teresa Reyes. Teresa was writing a story about her childhood in a GE class here on campus called Writing for the Artist. And she developed this story uh, from a seed idea into a finished animated script. Her story came from her father telling her stories at bedtime of a uh, cultural, mythological creature in Filipino heritage. Um, she developed this story over about a year and a half, working days and nights, sometimes on holidays through two summers, to complete this two-minute animated film. As luck would have it, Pixar's visit coincided with Teresa finishing her film and we arranged a private meeting where they got to screen the, her film. Basically, they were the first audience to see this film. And they were so blown away by not just the technical ability that she showed and her artistic creativity, but they also mentioned that it's so rare to see at the student level a film that shows heart and a personal story. And they were really blown away by this. They were so blown away that they asked Teresa to apply for the animation internship. And I'm very proud to announce that Teresa was one of eight students from around the globe to be accepted at Pixar's coveted animation internship. So Teresa wanted to be here, but she's there at Pixar. Uh, so she says hello. I got a text from her last night. This is no joke, and this is not even on the script. Uh, and she said, like in a very excited, nervous voice, they're going to keep me. So, yeah. So this is a big deal for us. Um, you know, our students go through many different avenues in careers, but Pixar is obviously in a place that's very hard to get to. And so this budding relationship with Pixar that we've started is not just great for Teresa, but it's also creating a path for future students who might not have ever thought that a place like Pixar might be a possibility in their future. And now thanks to Teresa, that road is began. Um, so we're now gonna enjoy Teresa's film that she completed here at Cal State Long Beach. I should also mention that um, Teresa worked with a film score student on campus in a film score class in the music department um, that was written specifically for this film and then later recorded by our very own 60-piece orchestra here. So enjoy. Ugat. <laughs> Iha, subukan mo to. Masarap to, dinuguan. Gustong gusto to ng mami at daddy mo. Uh, Lika, pasok ka. I'm okay here, Lola. Patang ito? Pili-pili?
Aba, ano nangyari sa'yo? Andito na ako. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Jersky, and I have the honor and privilege of being the provost of Cal State Long Beach. I'd like to add my welcome to the 2017 annual convocation. I want to thank Aubrey Mintz, head of animation, and his student, Teresa Reyes, for that spectacularly beautiful animation that celebrates heart, music, and culture. Teresa's artistic illustrations not only display one of our many talented students, but demonstrates how education can inspire the heart as well as the mind. As Aubrey mentioned, she was chosen for one of 10 very competitive spots by Pixar. In fact, we had two CSULB students chosen as finalists for that internship program. Please join me in congratulating him, our students, and the School of Arts for that wonderful presentation. <laughs> One of the reasons I enjoy working on our campus is the opportunity to work with passionate, smart, talented, and dedicated people. I would like to take a moment to recognize some of you. First, my extraordinary team. New to the campus this year is Dr. Kerry Johnson, our Associate Vice President for Undergraduate Studies, who comes to us from Merrimack College. Also, Dr. Jody Cormack, well known to many of you, acting as our Interim Vice Provost for Academic Programs and Dean of Graduate Studies, former Chair of the Physical Therapy Department. I'd like to ask my team to stand so we can give them a round of applause. Our academic deans, whose talent and commitment has helped make our university one of the most popular campuses in the nation. This year, we welcome Dr. Curtis Bennett, the new Green Dean of the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, who came from Loyola Marymount University. Deans, please stand and let's give them all a round of applause. Our wonderful department chairs, who we know do probably the most difficult jobs on all our campus, please join me in a hearty round of applause for this very hardworking and wonderful group of people. <laughs> of course, we have outstanding student government leaders led by ASI President Joseph Nino and the entire executive team. I recently had the pleasure of being a panelist with President Connolly and other administrators at the ASI Student Leadership Retreat. Unfortunately, I had a schedule conflict and had to leave a bit early from the panel. As I was leaving the stage, I unceremoniously fell off it. My glasses, cell phone, and pride went crashing to the floor. <laughs> when my staff later asked how it went, I could only remark that I definitely made a splash. Uh, thank you to all the students for being so gracious that day, and please join me in recognizing our student leadership.
In addition, I'd like to recognize the following campus leaders, starting off with Mary Stevens, our Vice President of Administration and Finance. <laughs> Many of you know that Mary is retiring later this year, and she is a beloved and highly respected administrator. She has been a wonderful partner to me, former provosts, and our entire executive team. Her legacy of strategic operations has enhanced our campus infrastructure and her impact on this campus and the entire CSU has been immeasurable. Mary, you will be sorely missed. <laughs> also, Tim Whitaker and Dave Costita, uh, stewards of the State Employees Trade Council, Dora Epodaka, Chief Steward of Academic Professionals of California, Robert Bob Irwin, CSULB Alumni Association President, Norbert Schurer, Chair of the Academic Senate, we'll hear from him later, Doug Domingo Foresti, President of the California Faculty Association. On behalf of the university, I offer thanks to each of you for your tremendous commitment to the success of our students and this campus. It's now my great privilege to introduce a special group of students who are here with us this morning. Each year, we carefully select a small number of students to be admitted to our campus as recipients of the President's Scholarship. Our scholarship program has an enviable history, building on the most recognized scholars program in the state of California and one of the most distinguished in the nation. Also with us this morning, Honoring us with their presence are the parents and family members of these high achieving students. Exceptional new scholars, parents and family members, would you please stand and be recognized? Please join me. Before I move on, let me say how grateful the university is to our alumni association, president's associates, individual donors, and the Division of Student Affairs for their invaluable support of the president's scholarships. The success of this mission would not be possible without all of you. Congratulations and welcome scholars. I wish each of you every success at CSULB. Now I would like to introduce Joe Nino, ASI president. He started his academic career at Cerritos College, where he quickly became involved in many organizations that inspired him to take on more leadership roles. He soon became the president of Phi Theta Kappa, an official honor society, and became a senator for the Associated Students of Cerritos College. The following year, Joe embarked on the even larger role of student body vice president. He then transferred to CSULB with an associate degree in kinesiology with the goal of completing our sports psychology undergraduate program. He decided to continue his pursuit of student advocacy and was elected as the ASI Senator for the College of Health and Human Services. Joe wants his fellow students to feel empowered at this campus and beyond. He advocates for student success by supporting programs that eliminate barriers. Our campus will benefit from his leadership and we are very fortunate to have him serving as ASI President this year. Joe. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Provost Sierski, for the introduction. Um, you know, it's really great to have someone validate how great you already think you are. <laughs> Sorry, when I get nervous, I say some really bad jokes, so bear with me. Okay, so good morning, everyone. And you know, once again, truly, thank you, Pre uh, Provost Sierski, for the introduction. And uh, also, uh, thanks to President Connolly for inviting me here today 
and uh, helping me address such a prestigious group. Uh, once again, my name is Joe Nino. I'm the ASI president for the 2017-2018 academic year. I'm a sports psychology major, uh, but one day I hope to join you in higher education and give back to the, to the system that I consider to change my life. So to start off, I'd like to take this opportunity today to talk to you about obstacles. Uh, as we all know, students are facing the greatest of obstacles just to attend this university. Um, myself included, by the way. Uh, our students are overworked, overextended, and oftentimes underrepresented. A recent study from the CSU Chancellor's Office reported that three quarters of our students are working over 20 hours a week. One in 10 is homeless, one in five food insecure, and too often our students leave here without a degree. Speaking of my struggles, I've personally had to choose between buying textbooks or skipping meals. I've had to work multiple jobs just to make ends meet. I've missed classes, failed a few actually, uh, and during my pursuits, I've had to drop out. That path was definitely not the formula of student success I had imagined when I decided to pursue an education. At the age of 16, I was diagnosed with an incurable autoimmune disorder. Uh, every day was and still is a struggle with my health. Paying for health insurance was unrealistic. Medication costs alone were more than my rent. My health and mental state were on an absolute roller coaster. And as much as I tried to obtain an education, my body just wasn't having it. Luckily, I decided to take a more holistic approach with my health. I changed my eating habits and made drastic lifestyle changes. It started to work. The pain subsided. And ultimately, I began to feel optimistic. I was resilient in pursuing an education. I have the privilege to stand before you today as an associate degree holder from, from Cerritos College, a former president of my honor society, and most importantly to me, a dedicated student advocate. My experience with facing adversity has translated into a passion for helping other students succeed and overcome their barriers to excellence. That's why I'm proud to be a part of an organization like Associated Students Incorporated which shares the same philosophy, same philosophy as me. We keep students first. ASI continues to take massive steps to serve more students. The food insecure through our ASI Beach Pantry, undocumented and international students by recently securing $10,000 worth scholarships, and the underrepresented through our establishing of a social justice and equity committee aimed at proactively re re representing student groups that have traditionally been marginalized or unheard. These efforts to support more students and help them overcome more obstacles are the collective legacy of Long Beach State students. At the end of the day, I believe we all play an important role in student advocacy. ASI and our diligence to promote and foster self and shared governance, faculty and staff, as you continue to be champions for students in and out of the classroom, and university administration, as you continue to push for programs and resources that ensure inclusive excellence. Each of us are often putting students first and speaking on their behalf at every opportunity. But sometimes we must recognize that being a student advocate is not always about speaking for students. Sometimes all we need to do is provide students the platform to speak for themselves. As we look into the future, let's ask ourselves how we all can continue to be better student advocates and provide students the right platform to overcome their obstacles. So thank you all for providing me this platform today and helping this student speak for himself. And as always, go Beach. Thank you for those remarks, Joe. We are very pleased and delighted to give you a platform, and so are we for other students. We're truly fortunate to have students like you who persevere in spite of adversity. You are part of what makes the beach so special. 
Now I'm pleased to introduce one of our outstanding faculty members. A professor in the English department, Norbert Schurer, has taught classes on literary criticism and research, 18th century British literature, and major authors like Jane Austen and J.R.R. Tolkien. He has been a member of the Academic Senate since 2008 and a member of the Senate Executive Committee since 2014. He served as our chair last year, and this year, after a unanimous and uncontested election, continues as our Academic Senate Chair. Such is his popularity. Norbert is a true supporter of our university and students. He wants his students to be not only academically challenged, but to leave us with a true appreciation of the nature of a university education. Norbert. Thank you, Provost Jersky. Good morning, and welcome to the academic year 2017-18 here at California State University, Long Beach. My name is Norbert Schur. I'm a professor in the English department, and I'm speaking to you today as chair of the Academic Senate. The Academic Senate, in case you don't know, is the highest elected body at CSULB. There are duly elected representatives of four constituencies on the Senate, students, faculty, staff, and administration. The Senate has two main functions, communication and policy making. So for one, we write policies on issues that affect all of us on campus, such as curriculum, student unit loads, academic advising, and education abroad. Secondly, and just as importantly, we are the only communications forum where all major constituencies of the university come together and talk on a regular basis. We sincerely believe that this communication has led to a sense of community and unity that means that events such as the recent uh, neo-Nazi and alt-right hateful agitation in Charlottesville will hopefully never happen here as long as we maintain those communication structures. Communication does not mean that we necessarily agree on anything, um, but it does mean that as many voices as possible have been heard. Of course, that in turn only works if everyone has an idea of what is going on on campus. To that end, I would like to spend the rest of my time this morning offering you a first glimpse at, will probably, at what probably will be the main six or seven uh, topics and issues facing us this academic year. I'm going to present them to you uh, as a brief guide to CSULB abbreviations and acronyms. <laughs> so the first and second abbreviations are EO and CO, which is the, an executive order from the Chancellor's office. Two or three weeks ago, the CO issued EO 1110, <laughs> which determines how we will achieve college readiness or academic preparation, that is, how we will make sure that our students have the necessary skills in the areas of writing and quantitative reasoning, or more colloquially, English and math. This will require a huge shift on campus, so we need to figure out together how best to implement EO 1110. Just the day before yesterday, this, the CO released EO 1100, uh, which speaks to our next abbreviation, GE, that is, general education. There are big questions regarding general education, such as, is GE meant to supplement students' education in their major, or is it meant to expose students to subjects they will never encounter in their majors? And is GE meant to be a unified experience, so something like a mini-major where three to six courses are related through topic, or is it meant to be a series of unconnected classes that fit best with our students' schedules and random curiosities? To answer these questions, ensure inclusive excellence, and shape our GE program accordingly, we need your input. Our fourth abbreviation is GI, the Graduation Initiative 2025, that is the umbrella for all these efforts and another mandate from the CO. The GI on our CSULB campus is implemented through HVDI, our, our fifth abbreviation, the Highly Valued Degree Initiative. We've only just started defining what a highly valued degree actually is, um, but we've made some great strides towards collaborative leadership in most of the HVDI's task forces, so we hope you will all continue to contribute to the GI and HVDI. 
Another big challenge for a campus that will require collaboration goes by the acronym of WASC, or uh, Western Association of Schools and Colleges. This is the organization that accredits universities, and this year we have to start writing our accreditation report for them. You will be receiving calls to participate, and I hope many of you answers these calls to turn this exercise into an opportunity to see what we want to keep, what we might want to change, and how we could improve education on our campus and better champion our students. Part of accrediting a university is always looking at teaching, and one particular way in which we do that here at CSULB is my seventh and final acronym, SPOT, the Student Perceptions of Teaching, better known simply as student evaluations. It is pretty clear that in the next year or two, we will move to entirely online evaluations. It is also pretty... <laughs> Thank you. It is also pretty clear from plenty of data-based research um, that switching to online evaluations means on average that fewer students will complete them and that teachers will receive lower scores for the same quality of teaching. For these reasons, we need to have a campus-wide discussion about how to implement online student evaluations, and that discussion will be most productive with your involvement. So, EO, CO, GE, GI, HVDI, WASC, SPOT are the acronyms, abbreviations, and topics that will probably dominate much of the discussion on campus in the upcoming academic year. Once again, it is important that all constituencies on campus participate in these discussions, so I hope you will make an effort to stay informed and reflect on your position. Once you have formed your own opinion, I encourage you to get in touch with me at norbert.schur at csub.edu, contact your elected academic senate representatives, or serve on some committee or task force or council or panel or board or planning group or working group to share your opinion to ensure that it becomes part of the discussion. That way, we will best be able to move forward sensibly and together to improve the experiences of our students, faculty, administration, and staff at CSULB in 2017-18. Thank you, and go Beach. T-Y-N. Uh, thank you, Norbert. <laughs> Thank you for your always insightful and constructive remarks. <laughs> Last year, I spoke of Plato's Sacred Grove and used it to refer to our university as a place to celebrate the past, examine the present, and shape the future. This sacred space allowed others to delve into topics that were atypical for that time period. The Grove also represented a safe place to question social norms and to express novel ideas and thoughts. As I reflect on the past academic year, I believe our sacred grove has taken on a whole new purpose. All that has happened in our world and nation this past year, and especially what occurred a few weeks ago, has left us with more questions than answers. We have witnessed and observed a new level of hatred that has shocked and stunned a watching world. I want to take this moment to condemn strongly what the neo-Nazi and white supremacists stand for. They disguise their hate, fear, and divisiveness with misguided nationalism. Given the rich diversity of our campus, our sacred space has no room to accommodate this level of violence and discord. Hatred will not win. I think, therefore, that our focus has to adjust to reflect the changes that are around us. The way we educate our students is even more important. We need to adjust to ensure our students are offered the best educational community we can provide. Indeed, a newly consecrated sacred space. I do believe, in fact, that we have been given an opportunity to reimagine what is possible. Albert Einstein, the well-known Swiss patent office clerk, said, out of clutter find simplicity, 
From discord, find harmony. In the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. We must offer hope to our students that they have the ability to positively impact the society that they live in with their education. We also must give them assurance that their degrees will benefit the wider society as well as themselves. As a university, we are charged with instilling in our students justified confidence in their abilities, talents, and potential. I had the pleasure of visiting an alumnus at Riot Games in Santa Monica, where I discovered, among other things, that the gaming world has moved on since my favorite game, Tetris. <laughs> the purpose of our visit was to investigate an internship pipeline for our students. Our alum mentioned that what frustrates him the most about Cal State grads is not their ability to perform the tasks at hand, but how they perceive their work. He gave me a fascinating example. He recently had three graduates, one from an Ivy League school, another from a UC, and a third from a Cal State. He asked them to rate their Java coding level from one to 10, with 10 being the highest. The Ivy League grad rated themselves at an eight, the UC grad at a seven, and the Cal State grad at a four or five. When he probed further and asked them some further questions to identify their actual ability, the results surprised him, but not me. The Cal State grad had an eight-level Java coding ability, the UC a six, and the Ivy League below a five. <laughs> Interesting. Our students graduate from Long Beach State ready and prepared to tackle any job within their field of study, but may not feel they are on par with their peers from other institutions. Why? Do we believe we are on par with other private or more visible campuses? Yes. Do we believe we are a second-tier institution that is just a state school? No. We are, in fact, a noted flagship campus with premier programs. And just to give you some examples from many, here are some examples of what the outside world is saying of us, indeed, of your success. Uh, Kiplinger's personal finance ranked us among the top 100 best values for public colleges. The Princeton Review's 2017 best colleges region by region designated us one of the nation's top public universities for our commitment to high quality, accessible education. We ranked fifth nationally in awarding bachelor's degrees to minority students on diverse issues in higher education's annual list of top 100 degree producers. US News and World Report ranked us fifth among public regional universities in the Western United States. The website schools.com ranked us the best four-year college in California, bar none. The list factored in. <laughs> the list factored in affordability, support services, and program availability. According to a 2016 report by the Education Trust, our campus has been one of the most successful four-year public institutions in this country at reducing opportunity gaps, the difference in graduation rates between typically underrepresented students and the rest of the university. It is a testament to every person in this room when our campus receives praise such as that. Every day, you dedicate your hearts and passions to our students. It is my privilege to share this passion with you. From a very long list, here is a small snapshot of the achievements within our colleges. Our School of Art, as we just saw earlier, is deservedly the nation's largest publicly funded art department. It is the first in the Western US to receive accreditation from the National Association of Schools of Art and Design. Our College of Business Administration is one of only 5% of schools worldwide accredited by the Association of Collegiate Schools of Business International. 
It was named an outstanding business school in the Princeton Review's 2016 Best 295 Business Schools Guidebook. The undergraduate engineering program was ranked among the best in the nation in a recent edition of US News and World Report's America's Best Colleges Guide. Our School of Nursing has an almost unbelievable 95% pass rate on the National Council licensure exam since 2010. Professor Teresa Wright of Political Science in the College of Liberal Arts recently created and led several of her colleagues in timely, well-attended teach-ins called Reclaiming Democracy. These workshops focused on last year's election and our nation and gave a much needed venue to our students and community to voice their thoughts and feelings about that watershed moment. Dr. Claudia Ojeda Aristizabal, assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, recently received a three-year $250,000 grant from the US Department of Energy for her research on strongly correlated materials in the two-dimensional limit. The College of Continuing and Professional Education, as we all know, broke ground on a state-of-the-art building scheduled to be completed by fall 2018 and built without state funds. The Liberal Studies program is now approved as an elementary subject matter preparation program by the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. This means that students who graduate with a major in Liberal Studies may demonstrate their subject matter competency through their coursework instead of taking a series of California subject examinations test. Again, a testament to the incredibly high standards across all our colleges of curriculum. And last but not least, the University Library will offer access to another wonderful program called Swank Digital Campus, a new streaming movie platform that can be viewed via tablets or mobile devices. Faculty may link the movies via beach board and have students view a film at their convenience or show it during class. The one danger I perceive in this particular program is that administrative offices may never be the same. <laughs> <clears throat> Some other notable campus highlights that I think we can all be very proud of. The beach continues to be very attractive to prospective students. We received over 103,000 student applications for fall 2017, 103,605. This is the largest number in Long Beach State's history. Freshman applications total just over 63,000, one of the highest among all CSUs, and transfer applications totaled over 31,000, one of the highest in the, in the country. Even in the face of what's happening in our country, undergraduate international student applications totaled 2,446, a 13% increase over last year. And for those of you looking for a more digital experience, uh, we have a new faculty research experience and expertise, F-R-E-E, -E, <laughs> database. And this lists faculty's research expertise and facilitates our university's ability to provide insightful analysis and opinions to other educational institutions, industry partners, and media. Thanks to VP uh, Min Yao and AVP Simon Kim for their successful work on this. Three faculty were recognized in the 2017 University Achievement Awards, Heather Barker, in design for her impact accomplishment of the year in RISCA, Stephen Mezik in chemistry biochemistry as outstanding faculty mentor in student engagement in research and creative activity, and Joshua A. Cutter in kinesiology for early academic career excellence award. As Norbert mentioned in his speech, we relaunched the HVDI high-valued degree initiative to provide academic scaffolding to respond to the Chancellor's Office Graduation Initiative 2025. In other words, this is 
our academic scaffolding that responds to the Chancellor's request. Based on strategic priorities, our strategic priorities, which just in case you haven't memorized them, include the following three key areas. Inclusive excellence, academic rigor, and devotion to the public good. Based on those three, we created four task forces to put a plan in place, and the task forces, led mostly by faculty, include reimagining the first year of college, research and evaluation to make sure that what we do actually works, student engagement, and communications to attempt to disseminate the information. Each area has given us a plan to strategize the best way to increase the quality of our degrees, while concomitantly increasing graduation rates by focusing on areas where students face barriers. At the inception of last year, we suspected that the activities we engaged in would also increase the four-year graduation rate. Early data, which I can reveal to you, hot off the press, shows that we not only reduced our achievement gap by half, but we also met our target four-year graduation goals for 2018-19. And in case those of you who are interested in numbers are waiting, our preliminary four-year graduation rate for our 2013 cohort increased from 16% for the 2012 cohort to about 22%. Now, an amazing achievement. As Norbert mentioned too, we received, as you know, a nine-year accreditation from WASC in 2011. Since then, WASC has updated its accreditation criteria, articulating five core competencies undergraduates should master at or near graduation. Those competencies are, nothing unusual, written communication, oral communication, quantitative reasoning, critical thinking, and information literacy. Here, in 2014, departments received notification about how well aligned their program outcomes were to both institutional outcomes and to those core competencies. In preparation for our institutional report due in January 2020, just around the corner, we will need to assess these competencies more globally at both the institutional and the department level. This is a good framework because it's of interest to us within which to focus on EO 1110 and EO 1100, as N pointed out. <laughs> Charlene Say, our new WASC accreditation liaison officer, or ALO, is therefore rolling out our core competency initiative asking departments to engage in a two-year assessment of two of the five core competencies relevant to your disciplines. Your contributions to the assessment of student achievement over the past several years have been invaluable, and we're excited to embark on this new collaborative effort together. I would like at this point to thank our retiring ALO, David Hood, for his outstanding work in this area over many years. I want to now share a tale about a university you know and love. Our story begins several years ago. Uh, in that year, the president had a state salary in addition to some non-state funding. The university was fully under the control of the state, its overseers ultimately being the governor, lieutenant governor, and various other leading individuals. The university was, however, beginning to depend more on itself given the always difficult state funding situations. 14 years passed. The university had its last state subsidy voted to it by the legislature. There was much anxiety and worry about the university's ability to stand on its own. The politics and practices of the university in that troubled year were in a chaotic state. 
student activism was becoming very notable. The principal intellectual interest in that year was the study of apparently non-job related material. And one of the strongest influences in university life remained K-12 school teaching. At the same time, university authorities raised the standards of admission and required examinations in writing and mathematics. This story ends happily many years later, as such tales always do, with the news that the university has an enormous endowment. What is the university's name? Yes, of course, it is Harvard. <laughs> I understand that today's political and educational climate is completely different, and we don't want to become Harvard for a start. But the point is this. I believe we need to reframe how we generate and retain external funding. The administration is open to new avenues and perhaps opportunities for outside entities to partner with our campus at our discretion, and we believe this could be a more sustainable model as our state dollars continue to decrease. We've moved, as everybody knows, from state-funded to state-supported, and we remain state-located. That said, here are some ways we are already going outside our state-provided resources for funding. Faculty and staff submitted 302 new external funding proposals, requesting almost $114 million. We received almost $53 million from federal, state, local sources, as well as corporate, private corporations and foundations. We administered approximately 400 new and continuing grants and contracts, totaling $35 million in annual expenditures, the highest in five years. Richard D. Green, a friend of the university, made a cash gift to endow the Richard D. Green Dean within the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. This is the third endowed CSU deanship in the system and our first on campus. The endowed dean position is supported by a significant contribution which will fund a CNSM graduate fellowship, teaching activities, scholarly work, and community service efforts. We got a $3 million grant from the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which will help students in the biotechnology program be trained in the theory and techniques of stem cell research. External partnerships such as these not only benefit the faculty involved, but also their colleagues and many students. Involving students in research, scholarly, and creative activities is one of our most powerful high-impact practices. Also, Academic Affairs continues to provide $2.2 million internally to support such faculty risk up. Last year, we established the Office of Undergraduate Research Services, OURS, a centralized unit on campus for undergraduate research, which provided additional research opportunities to 110 graduate students. The faculty had 62 faculty sponsors. A real life example of this undergraduate research is microbiology major, Selena Urfano who started with the BUILD program in the summer of 2015. She completed a summer internship in Argentina at the Fundación Instituto Le Loire Minority Health International Research Training Program. Urfano completed three poster presentations alongside her BUILD faculty mentor, Dr. Katarzyna Slowinska of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. From that research, Selena had two publications. Her most recent published paper, peer-reviewed in a high-quality journal, is on conjugation of paclitaxel to hybrid peptide carrier and biological evaluation in Jurcat and A549 cancer cell lines. Sadly, I understand only the five conjunctions.
By the end of December this year, when Urfano completes her time within BUILD, she will apply to PhD programs. We are halfway through our $22.7 million NIH BUILD grant, the largest in Long Beach state history. We are already starting to see the incredible impact this has on our students and by institutionalizing the effects of the program on our campus. So we expect to continue the work when the grant ends. We are very fortunate to have former CNSM Dean Laura Kingsford continuing her leadership role at the helm of this crucial program. One area of focus that has continued to be a passion and focus of our campus is the public good. Our faculty remain champions of representing our multiple communities. Dr. Gino Galvez is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology. He serves as the director of the Research and Evaluation Center for Latino Community Health Evaluation and Leadership Training. The center develops a broad array of health programs for underserved Latino communities. He serves not only the Long Beach community, but also as an evaluator on an NIH-funded initiative. As an evaluator, he is able to examine ways we can assist underrepresented students to enroll in doctoral programs. Dr. Laura Hoyt Dana, the director of the Center for Health Equity Research and an assistant professor in the Department of Health Science, is also a passionate champion for the public good. Her primary research interests are racial and ethnic health disparities, and specifically the relationships between social discrimination and health. She too was awarded a five-year, $2 million grant by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. In addition, she was awarded a three-year, 900,000 grant from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration to address an unmet need on our campus and in the Long Beach community. The grant serves to help young black men to combat substance use or HIV and hepatitis C infection. These community ambassadors and many others truly represent our campus's focus on our community. As they and many others continue to serve our campus and beyond, they embody our goal of public good. These two faculty are perfect examples of how we can explore our research passions while benefiting community neighbors. We also have much to boast about regarding educational and economic development collaborative partnerships. For example, the long-standing Long Beach College Promise, which extends the promise of a college education to every student in the Long Beach Unified School District, continues to gain momentum. And I was honored to present on this signature program at the previous White House, and afterwards to have lunch with our former VP, Joe Biden, and his wife, Jill. His wife, Jill Biden, for those who don't know, is a community college professor in English, and she is an absolutely wonderful example of a faculty member playing a public and a professional role. The Promise most recently received a Bridging the Gap grant from the James Irvine Foundation. Another thing which probably you've heard of is that we've been involved in discussions for creating a new CSULB downtown village. This student living learning community would consist, if it happens, of student residences, a new innovation and entrepreneurship center, lots of space for other suitable academic programs, and about 16 additional CCPE classrooms. This critical partnership would allow our university to reach beyond our educational institution to give back to the community that surrounds us. As President Connolly noted in this regard, quote, we are already close partners in education and hope to add more of our most precious asset, our people, to the downtown renaissance. We are better and stronger together, close quote. Jane's sentiment is reflected in the following poem, which I hope you will enjoy. It is Ozymandias by Shelley, written in 1818, so almost 200 years ago. Here it is. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, 
a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. What we accomplish collectively creates remarkable achievements we can pass down to future generations. The poem recognizes that individual egos and achievements do not survive. And as Virginia Woolf noted about another university in a dark time, she saw, quote, the light shining there, the light of Cambridge. As we sit in the Valley of Shadows, Long Beach State is also part of that light. Laced throughout history are the alliances that were forged to achieve a single goal or common purpose. These several entities, often from very different beliefs and perspectives, ignited a community and changed a generation. Right now, educational institutions like ours represent a beacon of hope to a watching world. Our university demonstrates the simple but powerful fact what we achieve together positively changes the future. We do this by working together to leverage what each individual department, college and program does so well. Working together also implies recognizing one another's efforts. For example, this year we had our first academic affairs barbecue where I was able to enjoy lunch with our hardworking and dedicated staff. I truly appreciate the time and effort our staff dedicate to ensure that our campus runs efficiently and effectively. I plan on having more events to encourage interactions between staff, faculty, administrators, and students in different departments and colleges. I'll also continue my faculty lunches with the purpose of hearing the good along with the not so good, but chiefly to empower faculty members to make changes they deem necessary. I have truly enjoyed this time. Meeting with you all has become one of my many highlights on campus. Last year I met with 175 faculty in this way and I plan on inviting more this upcoming year. If you prefer a digital means of connecting with me, you can also stay in touch with me on Twitter at provost underscore Jersky. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> in closing, I want to thank you all for all you do. I have witnessed the time and attention you have given to our students. Your lasting impact has not only helped change students' world views, but it has empowered a community. You reflect the agape, Greek for perhaps selfless love, that underlies all true education. The business of changing people's lives keeps me motivated to tackle problems and grounded on why we do what we can do. We break down barriers every day. I cannot think of anything more rewarding or important. Thank you and go beach. Now, thank you. Now I would like to introduce someone who continues to be a true champion for this campus and the Long Beach community. Someone who is committed to making the beach a safe place to express who and what we are. President Jane Connolly is dedicated to providing a welcoming campus climate for all students, faculty, staff, and alumni. She believes in creating an inclusive space for our students to maximize their educational experience and recognizes the diversity that adds excellence to our community. She understands what we face as an institution and advocates for our best interests. 
She makes herself available to individuals from across campus and outside it, and is truly interested in their thoughts, opinions, and ideas. She is actively engaged on our behalf with our local community, regional, state, national, and international leaders. We are very fortunate indeed to have her leading our university, and it is my great honor and privilege to serve as her provost. It's my great privilege then to welcome President Jane Close Connolly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, thanks for those kind words, Brian. But uh, hearing you say something about me and then go on to Shelley is a highlight. You know, it's, that's not my usual experience at all. So I'm uh, so pleased to be with you on this beautiful, in this beautiful venue and increasingly accessible venue. Thank you, Megan Klein Crockett, for your leadership on this. For the fourth, oh, yeah. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. And it's for the fourth time. Who knew I'd still be here? Ah, I'm really glad to be still here, to be sure. Uh, <laughs> That was kind of a shameless way to get a clap, too, wasn't it? Yeah. So I won't repeat all of um, Brian's welcomes just for the sake of time, but please know that I echo his um, appreciation, and I'm so grateful for your involvement. But I must say a uh, special welcome to our president's scholars, because you're like my guys, right? Uh, and their families. So glad to have you here, wherever they are. Will you wave at me? Where are the president's scholars? I don't know where they are, but... It's great to see you. And, and Arbery, thank you for sharing the um, talent of our students. You know, in, in the back of our minds, I know we always know it, but it's so great to be reminded that our students are surpassing and superlative in every way. But that's because of the faculty we have, right? We get great students, but it's because of the faculty, um, the staff who guide them and support them. So thanks, all you faculty mentors, for that. And, and Joe, uh, thank you also for sharing your story. It has successfully put all of my small hassles in perspective. I somewhat resent that, but I'm really glad. I'm really glad that you did this. I um, hope everybody enjoyed the pictures of our new faculty members and they've, who've recently started their careers at the beach. I got a chance to meet a few outside. Uh, new faculty and staff who are here. You want to wave at me? Uh, you don't have to, but yeah, you can wave. I, I won't hold it against you. Yeah. Um, uh, we really look forward to supporting your success and even more look forward to how you will change us for the better. And I really mean that because a, a university thrives when it can be inclusive to new people who come with their ideas. Uh, but remember, returning faculty and staff, you certainly remain the heart and soul of all we offer to our students. Uh, also here this morning is Dr. Kali W. Conley, who after 44 years of friendship and then marriage, remains my best friend and most enthusiastic supporter. Where's Kali? There he is. Thank you. Thank you, Kali. And now let me introduce somebody else who's new, Andy Fee. There he is. And where's, where's Andy? There he is. Oh, great. Thank you. There's Andy. So get to know him. Andy joined us as our new athletic director, and he's already shown terrific leadership. Andy and I didn't know each other, but Andy is from UC Santa Barbara and emerged from a, as a favorite from a very large group of applicants because of his knowledge of collegiate sports, but even more importantly, his commitment to academic excellence for our student athletes, who, by the way, already lead the campus in graduation rates. And you may not know that over half of our student athletes qualify as academic all-stars, they're on Dean's List and the President's List scholars. So they do well. Way to go, student athletes. And their wonderful coaches. <laughs> and certainly the advisors uh, at the Bigger Staff Academic Center who offer such fabulous guidance to them. Finally, but you're gonna forget everything else now, let me introduce Detecting K-9 Officer Avery. <laughs> 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 
Avery, yeah, stay, no, stay, stay for a minute if you can. So Avery is a two and a half year old Yellow Lab who is expert at sniffing out explosives and just making people feel better. You all feel better, right? Just looking at her, yeah. Her handler is Sergeant Ray Gonzalez. He will be introducing Avery around campus. So contact University Police Department, and as duties permit, Avery can visit student, staff, and faculty groups. She will, of course, bring Sergeant Ray along with her. Yes, okay. So thank you very much. That's so much fun. <laughs> I mean, it's a very serious problem, but it's really so much fun. Uh, I've been reflecting a lot about what to speak with you about this morning. There's so much happening at the beach, and my speech today will cover a lot of territory, because as I mentioned to you in an earlier address, we're living in VUCA land. Remember VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous opportunities, for sure, but also threats surround us. So consider this speech a window into the many things I spend time thinking about, if you have an insight about 2 a.m., 3 a.m., just text me. I'm thinking about them right now. <laughs> but before I focus my attention just on our campus, fascinating as it is, I want to say a few words about Charlottesville. I'm fully aware there are multiple interpretations of this event, but there is one clear and present danger that confronts our campus and most campuses across the nation. We must guard against any erosion of First Amendment rights while at the same time protecting our community our people, and our property. We must challenge each other to listen, debate with civility, and reaffirm American values. I remind you of Abraham Lincoln's words, with malice toward none, with charity for all. With firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to do all which we may achieve and cherish, a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Neo-Nazis, Identity Europa, the KKK, white supremacists, the Black Bloc, and white nationalists are not working to bind up our nation's wounds or achieve a lasting peace among the diverse groups who make up this great nation. Quite the contrary, their beliefs and some of their actions, and certainly their beliefs which they can freely share because of our Constitution, uh, are un-American. Their beliefs dishonor all who have lived and especially who have died for a democracy with liberty and justice for all. At the request of and as a courtesy to faculty and staff, thank you Professor Ye Kelly Young, my team of communicators and our legal counsel have put together a two-page resource sheet should you wish to discuss the intersections of free speech, ideological divides, violence, and legality in your classrooms and other places where you guide students. So just let us know if you want that and we'll make it available. But now back to the beach. It's typical to start the year off with optimistic statements about the future. Brian has done a fabulous job identifying just a few of our wonderful people and our wonderful um, um, accomplishments. I'll throw up a couple of other slides because I want you to uh, recognize that from every corner and every division of our campus, we are noticed and recognized for excellence. And please make no mistake, I am completely optimistic about the future of our university. We do face some looming challenges, there's no doubt. But we have faced looming challenges likely for the last 67 years or so. And so as the old song celebrates with a little pronoun change, we're still here. And a matter, as a matter of fact, we're here with some great style. I don't know if you went to Blair Field to see that, but they're great. In addition to a history of success, my optimism is based on the conviction that we can continue to build our commitments to student success, embrace challenges with innovative and entrepreneurial strategies, and maintain and improve our position as one of the nation's greatest comprehensive universities. We have shown the persistence and dedication to get hard things done. So today, I'll share with you what I've been thinking Optimism, I already told you, I'm really optimistic. We do, uh, we'll talk about some challenges that we face on and off campuses. Uh, I'll emphasize a little bit about money, that will not surprise you. I'll talk a little bit about growth and fixed mindsets, inclusive excellence on a smart campus, 
removing barriers, strategic planning that I anticipate will tackle our most important questions as we march or dance or run or jump or skip into 2025, and then some particular aspirations I have for next year. This past year, I supported a research effort, and thanks to Andy Hong and his team, to uncover strengths of our university that deserve more emphasis so we could communicate those strengths more effectively and attract more support, especially from our 310,000 plus alums. You will not be surprised that the excellence of our faculty and staff and academic programs, along with our beautiful location, thank you everyone who works on our grounds and keeps our buildings in working order and pristine shape, we really appreciate that. Those items certainly emerged as um, deserving more attention. Something else that emerged was a campus ethos that was described by the researchers as an insane, this is their words, insane commitment to removing barriers that prevent others, especially students, from succeeding. Thank you all very much for that insane commitment. <laughs> we can, I'm a psychologist, we can talk later if you want more. <laughs> I think it illustrates our belief that with the right environment, evidence-based pedagogies, high expectations, compassionate interactions, all the students we admit, because our standards are very high, and you heard Brian talk about the numbers, every student can achieve a beach degree. I consider student success, by the way, a very complex metric that certainly includes timely graduation, but is so much more. And you've seen so, you know, one example, Teresa's example with her uh, video. Our students should leave us as thinkers, doers, great communicators, compassionate and civically engaged community members, leaders in their chosen professions, and well prepared to be critical and skeptical communications, uh, skeptical uh, consumers of information. That last one is really important in these days. I think as we embrace an 18 month process of strategic planning starting this fall, we will be in an even better place to propel our students forward toward lives of success. I'll come back to strategic planning in a moment. There are, however, challenges looming that are somewhat out of our campus control, but can have a significant effect on our abilities to add that edge of excellence that each of our students uh, deserve. So the dark clouds, that, that's danger. Okay, just if you didn't get my image there, I want you to know. But we put the pyramid so we'd feel upbeat too. <laughs> for example, good news for the planet but bad news for universities is that birth rates are plummeting. At least for a while, the country is actually running out of teenagers. What would that be like? Can you imagine? We're running out of teenagers. And uh, as, as an, a local uh, example of this, in just a few years, there will be 5,000 fewer Long Beach Unified School District 12th graders. Think about that, 5,000 fewer. The sheer number of universities and colleges continues to decline. Now most of that is currently among the for-profit sector and small liberal arts colleges that suspend operations, cut programs, or merge with other entities because of financial exigencies, mainly caused by plummeting enrollment. But don't overlook universities just like ours. Uh, where there's been draconian cuts in public higher education in Wisconsin, Illinois, Arizona, Louisiana, and Pennsylvania, to name just a few. When, this, when the teenagers start reappearing in 2023, the predictions are they will be much more diverse than previous college-going populations and significantly more economically di distressed than previous cohorts. Obviously, we may think we're in a particularly good position to weather enrollment and student economic diversity challenges. We certainly work hard on it right now. But we're still vulnerable despite the privilege of being a state-located school. Uh, I was going to say supported, but that's rapidly disappearing. State revenues are increasingly directed toward K-14, but we're not in that 13-14 bubble, right? It's only, it's community colleges and, and great for them. 
but their state resources are directed there, healthcare, prisons, pensions, and other mandatory costs, leaving smaller and smaller portions for the discretionary parts of the budget. And you may not know, but we live in the discretionary part of the budget. And while state funds account for shrinking portions of our total budget, our student success and public good commitments require greater and greater investments in our students. For example, the challenge to remove barriers to four-year graduation rates for those students who wish that path costs a lot more money because of needed financial aid, increased advising, and more classes and more sections. What are some other threats on and off campus that require our attention? The list is long as we face an aging campus infrastructure, escalating pension and health costs, salary concerns among our employees, uncertainties about federal funding, insufficient parking between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. I had to say this before you would say it. Sorry, Mary, I saw you there. Um, escalating costs to buy or rent homes in this area. All the horror, horrifying isms of many brands that surround us, unfortunately, and a growing national mood that higher education is not delivering on its promise to be the great social and economic equalizer. By the way, higher education is delivering on that promise, but the national conversation indicates that a large percentage of Americans think we do more harm than good. Crazy, but it's there, so we have to be aware of it. So these are daunting challenges, big issues that really deserve our sustained attention as we plan for the future of our campus. So the strategic planning process we envision must look on campus, E-O-C-O-H-V-D-I-G-I-G-E, WASC spot, for sure, and some other things I'll mention, but also must look off campus because those are forces that really will threaten us as a public university threaten our viability as a public university in California. I think figuring out new ways to keep our university viable will require a growth mindset. Growth mindset means that we're willing to try hard things and believe that persistence will pay off. People with growth mindsets accept that mistakes are inevitable and are actually learning tools. This is in contrast to a fixed mindset that drives us to be risk averse that is, we're afraid of making mistakes. We avoid new challenges, we avoid change, and we are easily discouraged if we hold a primarily fixed mindset set. Doing new and hard things actually makes our brain better, our brains better. Trust me, I know that, I saw that slide. It's better, it's really better. It's true, it's true. In the context of, at best, a stagnant state budget, we must embrace the ambiguity of having to do more to be more entrepreneurial while passionately keeping our public good mission. We must change some things if we want to offer our students high impact educational experiences like research with faculty, international travel, service learning, internships, and, and so on. The state contribution, already signaled by the way by the State Department of Finance for next year, is thought to be 3%. That's down a whole percent from this year, so it really will not be an increase. So as we are in this volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous environment, believe me, it's on steroids right now. We've already shown we can excel for our students in smaller projects. Scaling up is difficult, but we have the insane commitment to do so. We just need the money. Everyone should check out, by the way, engineering's best program. If you're not yet a believer in inclusive excellence and evidence, based pedagogies, you will if you learn about this program. So thank you, Dean Golshani, for that and your, your incredible uh, group of faculty and staff who made that happen. So new ways outside our traditional revenue sources must be investigated, and Brian has talked about a few. I anticipate our strategic planning process will uncover many of these opportunities. While the funds from the state are vital for our survival, they no longer present or allow that edge of, edge of excellence that we know we can deliver to our students. And again, thank you faculty, advisors, and student affairs professionals for, for providing now so many edges of excellence opportunities. I owe that term, by the way, to Mike Walter. I think he might be here, so thank you, Mike, for that edge of excellence term. Increasingly, we must dust off our entrepreneurial skills to figure out how to pursue our public good agenda 
while being expected to operate more like a private university. This is not easy, but there are models across the nation of the best universities finding new ways to create revenue that supports their well-deserved distinctive identities. We can do it, we can do it better than Harvard, by the way. I know that. I know that there may be, <laughs> yeah, some, some Harvard people there, like, yeah. I know that there may be some people in the audience who feel as we move in this direction, the state will pull back resources. Consider, however, the 30-year trend in California's support of its university. The 30-year trend is down, and we'd be asleep at the wheel with a fixed mindset if we anticipated some significant jump in the state budget. That's not a real graph, by the way, but I thought it really looked good uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, it's not based on, but it's something like that. While our strategic planning work this year will ferret out many more from my, many more, from my perspective, our core, our, our core skills and assets are around instruction, research, evaluation, community outreach, creative products in a way, athletics, our space on campus, and our relationships with our alumni, other friends in business, industry, the arts, and government. We will have to work together to figure out how to better transform these skills and assets into resources for our students, our faculty, and our staff. Another thing we'll have to face as we become more entrepreneurial is that we need a budgeting system that promotes and rewards risk-taking, innovation, and careful attention to new opportunities that fall within our mission to educate Californians, produce important and useful research, and contribute to the public good. We don't have a system like that now, but as our context changes, we'd be asleep at the wheel with a fixed mindset if we didn't respond. Uh, Provost Jerski and Vice President Mary Stevens will be, taking, will be talking a lot about this in the coming months, and I thank them for their leadership. So far, I've suggested that we're up for challenges, that we must strive to develop growth mindsets that will support a more entrepreneurial campus, and that our strategic planning work will help us settle on priorities for action, recognizing that our superordinate goals are to create a campus that promotes well-being by removing barriers to students and everyone else's success. In other words, we, we will become a model of inclusive excellence with financial smarts. So I hope I haven't tired you out already. Don't go to sleep. <laughs> but do try those. I, I've been afraid to get in them because I was afraid I couldn't get out of them. So I. <laughs> with grace, you know, and I, I have a certain, a certain persona to try to keep there. So uh, I don't do that so well. So uh, I'm going to just switch gears for a little while and share what I, ident I identify as more particular goals I have for the campus in the coming years. I want us to reach and surpass our annual uh, goals for the graduation, or better known as GI, um, initiative of 2025. I want every student who wants to graduate in four years with a great education to be able to do so. It's telling to me that in a relatively short amount of time, although I know the seeds of the success uh, were planted uh, much earlier, we moved from a 15% four-year rate to an almost 22% four-year rate. There are students who want this, they want a four-year path, and with some help, we were able, with some help offered to them, we were able to help them make it happen. So let's not divert our students with threats of low quality or myths about students being pushed out. This is for students who wish to pursue a four-year rate. And it's also for students who wanna graduate one semester early. It's for every student to have the best possible experience with no barriers put in front of them by us. I want us to make progress writing this 2020 strategic, 2025 strategic plan that I've mentioned. I know Dushi is gonna be uh, giving a lot of leadership that, to that. I also want us to meet our 2017, 2020 goals. This will be a big deal, the, uh, the, plan, the strategic plan to 2025, because tens of thousands of students, faculty, and staff uh, will be affected by the decisions we make over the next 18 months. So please, please engage. I want to accelerate the work of the Inclusive Excellence Commission. I'll talk more about that later. 
I want to be partners uh, with our deans and our uh, university relations and development staff in raising at least $30 million in private funds, including $2 million each one for Blair Field and two million for our Alumni and Visitor Center. So thank you, Andrea Taylor, Vice President Andrea Taylor, Andrea Taylor for your leadership. Uh, you know, just a year and a half, two years ago, we completed our Declare campaign, uh, raising far more than we had anticipated. And um, I think when we have people who are ready, willing, and able to tell our story to uh, friends, to alums, to is industry, uh, we attract quite a bit of private investment, because who wouldn't want to be partners with the beach? I want to create an academic integration plan. I won't create it. I want to support it, I should say. I want to support others to do it. An academic integration plan for the Earl Burns Miller Japanese Garden. I call on everyone from every division and every college to consider how we would do a better job integrating the singular campus gem into our students' learning experiences. You don't find a lot of campuses with Japanese gardens, and we should be making the most of that. I want us to reimagine our planning and facilities processes so that we can build more affordably on campus, thus attracting more capital investment from donors. There is no state money for new buildings, and our campus must grow to be viable. We need to rethink and update our internal budgeting processes. I've mentioned this before. The current system is too centralized and is not responsible, responsive enough in this VUCA environment. This will feel good to all who have rightfully complained about too much centralization, but it comes with significant accountability and will demand a growth mindset from all of us. We must continue to institutionalize the build grant initiatives that Brian mentioned and re Yes, I'll, say, I'll stop there, and I want to say another thank you to Dean Laura Kingsford, former Dean Laura Kingsford, for her brilliant leadership in the BUILD effort. And I hope we'll uh, reach another milestone in our annual research expenditures and go from 35 to $40 million. $40 million is a, a kind of trigger point for us to be seen um, in a different way uh, nationally, and Simon Kim will explain that to you. Everyone on campus benefits when we are, at the we are a center of discovery and can offer or manage funded opportunities to take part in research, do research, and offer research training. I'd like to advance our number of international students without, uh, while preserving access to Californians. This is a highly political issue, but it's really a no-brainer when we think of our flat world and our students' needs to be global citizens. I we need to hire a much more diverse tenure track faculty. Let's become more innovative in developing strategies that attract and keep an increasingly diverse, and diverse in every way, faculty so that our students can see themselves as professors. We need our students to move into the ranks of higher education. So thanks, Joe, for your ambition to do that. So doing searches like we've done, done them is unlikely to create change. So let's think about new ways to search for our next generation of colleagues. Another right-headed right opportunity we have is to completely update our so-called remedial education offerings to match research-based evidence on our campus as well as nationally that many remedial experiences do not regularly even up a student's chance to graduate and actually can discourage many learners from persisting from the first to the second years. Slow them down to their degrees. I'm very interested in this and will track our evaluations very closely. The strategic planning process will be our key to our work, will be key to our work over the next eight years. So many questions need answers or at least a punch list for action. For example, how big should we be and how many students should live on campus? Are we planning for that? How many students can we serve online with excellence and positive outcomes? Consider that nationwide now, 45% of first-time college students are over 26 years old. This is perhaps a population that can thrive and learn online. How do we help our athletics program be an even better asset in growing beach pride among current and former students? Our success on playing fields is a strong strategy to keep our alums connected, and that's a very good thing for them and for us. 
Are we using our space strategically? What should be moved? Okay, get nervous. What should be moved? Uh, to allow for right-sizing our academic and student services mandates. What's a plan for empty spaces that honors our native nations while permitting the essence of Pavanga, a place for learning, to expand to meet the needs of those we now turn away? And thanks to Craig Stone and many others for tackling this issue. Thank you. This, by the way, is a particular problem to the general one. How do we retain the best of the past while meeting the needs of the present and the future? What, we, what are we already doing that could attract greater investment from individuals, business, industry, foundations, and the public sector? What are other processes we must modernize and streamline to reduce paperwork and hassles? How do we become a smart campus? By the way, I have asked VP Min Yao to help us digitize as many routine tasks as possible, align procurements for better deals in IT, increase our cybersecurity, and on and on. I've asked them to do a lot of things. The great thing is, is uh, Vice President Yao here? There he is. The great thing is he actually knows what to do, so he knows how to do it. So please work with him using a growth mindset. Everything I've suggested will require change, but we think it will be a good thing. What should our student body look like? More graduates, more transfers. Norbert's already mentioned the general education. I don't really know much about general education, but I think it's a no-brainer that we should, what we should offer should be cohesive and portable among numerous uh, majors. But I don't know much about GE. What's the academic calendar of the 21st century? How can we develop more centers of excellence that are interdisciplinary, represent the best in research and teaching opportunities, and contribute to the public good in our region and our world? That's a tall order, but we are working uh, on a few ideas. We can't afford to launch 100 of them, but I'm sure we can launch a few, uh, and it will make a big difference. How many international students should we have? I mentioned I want us to grow, but how big? How do we maintain and improve our Long Beach College promise? This collaboration has established us nationally as a model university, but how do we make it better? How do we further reward faculty and staff who are employing high impact practices that offer students transformational opportunities? How do we grow internship opportunities and undergraduate research for students? I recently learned that the College of Business Administration had increased its number of of interns in just one year by 38%, up to about 608, if I'm right, Dean Salt. And so please talk to him, but talk to his college advisors who took all the credit for that out there in the, uh, uh, I don't know where they are, but they said, oh, it, they did it all. And I'm sure they're right. Right, Dean Salt? You're probably right. Do we have any programs of mediocre quality that don't belong here across every division? We don't have room for mediocrity. How do, we come, how do we become a more 24-7 service-oriented campus? We have more students on campus. We have to be, become more 24-7. And we need a flatter organization that is more responsive to all. And consider our pyramid of student services. Remember, those are the four messages I made you suffer through because I find this interesting. Um, what are the key student services that we must keep and expand to be sure that each student is getting a fair shot at success. We must minimize costs for our students. Tuition is only one piece of their costs. I'd ask every faculty member to consider the cost of textbooks, especially those with electronic bells and whistles. I'm told by the students they cannot be sold as secondhand copies. These, these kind of books are clearly designed to make publishers rich and widely reported by students as keeping them poor. So please consider that in terms of keeping our students viable. How shall we tr stay true to the First Amendment, back to some earlier comments, in an ideologically divided nation? These are serious threat, there are serious threats to freedom of speech from every point on the political spectrum. Violence and or shouting down provocative speakers are not the answers. Please, everyone, get educated and educated others so we don't face the tragedy of losing a member of our community in a violent confrontation. 
Some of the groups I've mentioned earlier show up for speakers and other demonstrations just to cause violence. They come with weapons and they intend to fight. Our students can be caught in the crossfire. It's best not to encourage them to attend some of these events. And it would be heartbreaking to lose one. We've already had the experience of losing one of our students in a terrorist attack caught in the crossfire. Let's not, Noemi Gonzalez, let's not let that happen closer to home. As you can see, I'm a president with questions who needs your best thinking. Much of this help I know will come from various existing committees and councils, and I thank everyone who works on those. I'll be looking forward to guidance from Academic Senate, the College Councils, Staff Council, and the Commission on Inclusive Excellence. As some of you may recall, we impaneled the Commission on Inclusive Excellence last January to move us toward a national university model of an organization that evens up everyone's chances to be successful. And thank you, Vice President Carmen Taylor and Provost Brian Jersky for accepting the co-chair responsibilities for that. We'll do this by removing barriers to success. In collaboration with other entities on campus, the commission will support and report back findings from a variety of campus surveys we'll accomplish this year. So we'll have a strong baseline from which to plan and implement strategies aimed at eliminating practices, norms, and attitudes that create systemic difficulties for any of our diverse community members. Your input into the commission, to the commission, will be vital as we learn the stories and experiences of the beach community with greater clarity. We must do frequent environmental scans, so to speak, to build a proactive plan for equity and not simply be reactive to campus or external threats. So let me end by mentioning growth mindset, no barriers, innovation and entrepreneurship, strategic planning, inclusive excellence, taking our future into our own hands, freedom of speech that includes almost all speech, but with a voluntary commitment to civility, I hope each of you will make and encourage in others, and an, and an environment, excuse me, an environment engineered to provide universal, targeted, and specialized services to all of our students. This is a lot of content, especially in an opening speech, but I'll be coming back to you often investigating how we continue on our journey. Each item I've mentioned, I truly believe, lies along the path or is shaping that path to intellectual rigor, inclusive excellence, and public good. I promise to lean in to the needed work and welcome your consultation and creativity. If we can seek, as President Lincoln said, to bind the nation wounds and, all, and do all we can to foster a just and lasting peace among ourselves, this will be our best year yet. Together, everything is possible. And that's the truth. Go Beach! Thank you, Jay. That was an example of the kind of inspirational leadership that our university and country need right now. And it also concludes this year's convocation. Thank you all very much for attending. Do good work. Have a great year. Go Beach.